difficult questions. There are two roving microphones. Yeah, I'm Howard Yates, um, founder of Tento Technologies. Um, possibly the uh, weakest link <coughs> in, on the web uh, today is the uh, username password um, method of authentication. The weakness arising from the huge duplication of security credentials uh, right across the web. Do you think there is any scope for scaling up to a system whereby there might be um, a, uh, a cloud-based authentication service, a bit like perhaps a bit like DNS, uh, where websites could use that service to authenticate their users? Well, of course, a number of websites already authenticate using Facebook or Twitter or whatever, um, which can provide benefits to the website operator as well as to the service provider. Um, that's one approach. Um, another approach, of course, is just to get your laptop browser to remember your passwords. And um, that's, that's what I do in respect of the very large number of very low-value passwords that you get from websites who are insist on you having a password not because it performs any security function but as a marketing thing they want you to feel that you are a member of their website club and of course dealing with that the random string and tell the browser to remember it is um, an appropriate level of effort. Mark Josephs, Birmingham City University. First of all thank you Ross for, for opening our eyes to all these different uh, aspects of, of life. Uh, really fascinating. Um, I just want to focus on on the Gordon Brown, Kirsty Walk uh, example you gave of um, the, the dangers of, of having all our medical records available to everyone. I don't think that that's so much scale, but in itself causing the problem, but scale exacerbating the problem because um, if we take any hospital, a celebrity going to that hospital is likely to, their, their records are likely to be looked up by every uh, worker in the hospital and that person is then going to be fired <laughs> uh, uh, quite uh, in, the, in the next few days. But, so there is a, a problem there, um, but it, it obviously uh, it, it makes it, it worse by, by, uh, by scaling things up. I don't know if, if you agree with that or not. Well, um, it tends to be down to how individual organisations deal with this. The, the Harvard HMO, for example, for some years maintained a set of entirely bogus records of the Kennedy family, whose entire function was to lead to the disciplinary dismissal of any member of staff who looked at them. Um, uh, we, we suggested this once or twice to the National Health Service, and they were absolutely aghast at the idea. In fact, the, the NHS were rather delighted at the idea that they didn't have any central figures whatsoever uh, of the number of people whose privacy was compromised through things like PDS. And they, when we put in a freedom of information request, they said with some pleasure that we'd have to write to every single NHS organization individually. So there's, there's, there's an example of a, uh, of, of a security economics failure. The minister sets what the policy is, but he sees to it the costs of failure fall on the Caldecott Guardians and something like 12,000 different NHS organizations. Uh, my name is uh, Eric Elwasi and I'm an IT security advisor. Uh, it's very interesting uh, what you've uh, put across about the social media companies uh, versus the governments. Um, basically, last year they were the villains. They were not paying their taxes and now they are on the side of the public uh, <laughs> trying to fight governments you know to bugle into their their uh, inf confidential information uh, my question is what uh, to what extent do you think the it professionals should play uh, in this you know in this battle uh, should we be striking like junior doctors <laughs> If you're going to do research with other people's data, um, then you have to do it ethically. Now, this is something that's fairly ingrained in universities, and we have got structures of ethics committees and so on and so forth. Um, I would say that it's also important even if you're running a business. And the reason it's important um, is the law norm gap. It typically takes about 15 years for legislators to catch up 
with what's going on in technology, right? Because you have to wait until politicians are in opposition, because that's the only way you get to speak to them. You never get to speak to a minister that's too surrounded by civil servants. So you have to be able to get, to get at people while they're in opposition and get the ideas into their heads so that these will then mature into bills in due course. And as a result, um, if you're a businessman, you don't know whether, whether your business plan is going to be thought in 10 years' time to be so creepy that there's going to be a law against it. Right? There's no deterministic way of figuring that out. You can't just go to a lawyer and get an opinion. So what you should be doing is running the same kind of exercise that we academics do. Go and talk to the people whose data you will be using for some purpose or another and say, is it OK that we do this? Is it OK that we take your um, health data, for example, and then use that to sell you um, exercise regimes or sports equipment or whatever? And if you find that that is acceptable to people who are representative of your customers and the people whose, whose data you will use, then you're probably in pretty good shape. But if they say, hang on a minute, that's just really, really creepy, then maybe you should think of a different business plan. Jonathan Kerr Gartner. I see a rise in interest in government in using strong cryptography like blockchain as a mechanism for governance and accountability. How do you square that with the desire to weaken cryptography in every, almost every other way of it's being applied? I'm slightly sceptical about the use of blockchain in government. I know that there's been a big um, push recently with people who've got technology to sell and there's been a report come out. But if what you want to do is to see to it that there is strong consensus um, among records in a department, there are very straightforward traditional mechanisms that you can use to do that. Um, time stamping services, digital signatures and so on, um, which don't require you um, to burn $100 million a year worth of electricity looking for cryptographic um, um, hashes. So if consensus is what you want, we've got good, easy, simple engineering ways of doing it. You spoke earlier about how the need to protect the platform uh, resulted in, rather belatedly, security being added to um, original mainframes and PCs and finally mobile phones. Do you see the same sort of thing happening with the upcoming Internet of Things where we will see huge numbers of you know, ridiculously cheap consumer devices proliferated in, in huge numbers? across the globe. Internet of Things is the currently fashionable saying for embedded systems. And we've been doing stuff with embedded systems since the 1980s, you know, basically since microcontrollers became cheap enough. So Internet of Things, to me, tops of stuff that I've been doing on things like goods vehicle tachographs or prepayment electricity meters or whatever. Um, some of these have the form of platforms. <coughs> Um, very often the platform ambitions are greatly overblown. The idea, for example, that smart meters would provide an alternative kind of uh, way of getting broadband to UK homes was always basically a fantasy. Uh, and, and the communications to smart meters are now one of the things that's, that's endangering the whole product. So I would be careful about making platform arguments around Internet of Things. Uh, what's probably going to happen is that we'll see to it that lots of devices um, acquire an associated cloud service very often for things like speech and gesture interfaces. And that does raise issues, privacy issues, right? If you, if you end up with microphones and cameras in every inhabited space of the planet, which are reporting back to data centers in other countries, then there are issues there, yeah. Uh, but they're not platform security issues per se. They're um, perhaps more generic privacy issues. Thank you, Ross. So I'd now like to ask Professor Andy Hopper from Cambridge to propose the vote of thanks. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, very special lecture has had yet another brilliant uh, speaker, uh, somebody I know well. So if you forgive me, there are several things initially I'll say about him or I will not say about him. Uh, for example, uh, that he is a very good citizen, and you may be interested to know that he is 
a member, a trustee, a member of the council, a trustee of the University of Cambridge, and has done so for 10 years. Um, I will not say that he's a, I happen to know, a musician who plays the bagpipes. Um, and I will not say, his wife is here, that he's a grandfather. But what I will say is that uh, here is a very insightful lecture which poses the question, what are the limits to scale, science, engineering, or other question mark? And we heard about that in hardware, it's a ticket scale, it's done deal, right? Uh, that's what I heard you say. In software, ooh, a little more tricky, not a done deal, and you started using the word people. Introduce people, it gets a little more complex. Then we heard about privacy. And again, that related to people and produced all sorts of dilemmas, uh, access at scale. And we heard about IT businesses uh, and the lock-in uh, that uh, we experience, whether for technical reasons, emotional reasons, but again, these people things uh, came in. Then we had quite a bit about uh, a subject uh, that Ross has pioneered, uh, security economics, which relates to incentives and trust, but also the way we see initial costs of systems versus later costs on systems. And then we started here and got people again, except the word you used uh, uh, was crooks, right? But they're still people. Uh, so online crooks got smart, uh, the crook economy. Uh, crooks uh, try and avoid hotspots of crime. But I can see a theme through all this uh, continuing to emerge. And towards the end, uh, we heard about uh, intelligence services, police, and, and how they are scaling or how they, what their uh, attitude to scale is. And uh, there I heard the phrase, uh, uh, humans need a trust anchor. And finally, we uh, heard about uh, research, uh, a forward-looking perspective, and some of the principles about dealing with people and humans and, and so on. So I hope uh, that uh, you have enjoyed this tremendous breadth as well as the obvious depth that is there as well. Tremendous breadth, uh, as much breadth as perhaps anybody can ever deliver. Uh, these were very wise words of experience from an engineer. Uh, he has had an effect on the community, on society. I hope he has had a uh, an effect on you as the audience as he has on me as one of the listeners. And so I hope you have a better feel for the answer to the question, what are the limits to scale? Is it science, engineering, uh, or people? <laughs> Perhaps that's the other. So could I ask you now to congratulate Ross on a splendid, fantastic lecture, uh, and we wish him well in his future work <laughs> providing answers to some of these uh, challenges. Well done, Ross. And that brings this evening's uh, proceedings to a close. But before doing so, I'd like to mention two people who've been particularly instrumental in making tonight's event such a success. Those are Pam Fagan from the uh, BCS, who helped organize it, and Professor Philippa Garden, who does such sterling work chairing our awards committee. Thank you both. I wish you'd join us. Thank you.